management of natural resources lecture so coming to the introductory part of this particular lecture in this lecture we will look at some of our resources and how are we using them this should make us think about how we ought to be using our resources so as to sustain the resources and conserve our environment for the future generations so let's start with how to manage okay how to manage things look usually you can manage a thing by creating awareness awareness about the problems caused by the things you are using for example the over exploitation of the resources over the ages an example of this is the ganga action plan of 1985 okay so it is always better to have a scientific approach right so to estimate the amount of impurities we usually make the use of microorganisms and harmful infectants for example we usually use coliform so let us learn what is a coliform okay so coliform it is a group of bacteria found in the human intestine whose presence in water indicates contamination by disease causing microorganisms given below is a chart okay which shows the impurity levels when you use coliform okay so the diagram so this is your chart okay this chart shows the amount of the disease causing microorganisms in ganga before implementing the ganga action plan which was very high i mean the amount of impurity was very high so what can be done to reduce this so there is a great idea which has been developed over years by our scientists it's a simple one just reduce recycle and reuse so if at all this can be done in a properly divided fashion in this way things would be much better now let us come to the definition part so let us define what actually reduce means reduce what so reduce actually means to relatively lessen the use of our resources okay then coming to recycle it is the act of processing used or abandoned materials for use and creating new products and reuse is the act of using an item more than once okay so that we can help it sustain for a longer time without being wasted now you might all be thinking what is the real need for management okay what is the need for management note that the resources are not unlimited these natural resources have to be used under control so we require a very long term perspective if at all these are over exploited this won't be sufficient for the future generations hence a proper management is to be implemented so that we can have control over all this now let us study about the forests and the wildlife okay forests are nothing but biodiversity hotspots a biodiversity is an area of a range of different life forms some of the species here are bacteria fungi ferns nematodes insects etc the aim of the conservation is to try to preserve the biodiversity which we have inherited for the future generations to experience it okay we shouldn't be selfish now we all use forests extensively not we but most of them so those people are called as stakeholders so some of the examples of a stakeholder are the people who live in and around the forests industrialists which are related to the forests the forest department officials 
and wildlife and nature enthusiasts okay so how do we use a forest I mean for what did you ever think of that so what do we expect from a forest so we basically extract the firewood and the bamboo from a forest so over exploitation of our Indian forest resources by British happened pre-independence so even after independence there wasn't any considerable control so forest resources ought to be environmentally and developmentally sound hence we need a sustained management for a better cause for a better survival of the forest and the better survival of the mankind and the life okay so what can be done in a sustainable management so this actually includes some awareness programs for the sustaining of our forests. The most famous example is the Chipko movement or the Chipko Andola of 1970. This act spread widely among the people. It was a grassroot level movement in villages where villagers used to hug the trees or the forest to prevent their mass felling by the contractors. Okay. This was a very great moment. Now, coming to the concept of water for all. So, as the name suggests, it's quite straightforward. This scheme was introduced with an aim to supply uninterrupted water supply to all those areas suffering with water scarcity. So, these goals can be achieved with the help of a dam and a water harvesting technique. Fine. Now, let's go in detail about dams. So, how are dams helpful? These ensure the storage of adequate water, not just for irrigation but also for generating the electricity. Canal systems leading from these dams can transfer the larger amounts of water to great distances. An example is the Indira Gandhi Canal in India. The main use of dams is to deal with social problems, economical problems, and environmental problems. Similarly, we have another technique called as water harvesting. Okay, this is also a part of the water for all scheme. So let's learn about the water harvesting. This one is a scientific method of soil and water conversion. Sorry, conservation. Here the aim is to develop primary resources of land and water and to produce secondary resources of plants and animals. Okay? To, to produce a secondary resource of a plant and animal. So this one actually prevents the ecological imbalance. Water harvesting is an age-old concept in India. It's nothing new. These techniques are highly local specific. So it depends on the soil, it depends on the water availability the rain in the area so to get an idea of what actually water harvesting is let me show you a schematic of what water harvesting is so given below is a diagram of the water harvesting setup okay I think this is clear now let us study about the coal and petroleum. As you all know, these are very highly efficient fuels for generating energy in huge amounts. These fuels are derived from a special fuel called as a fossil fuel. Now, what are fossil fuels? Any idea? For these are fuels such as coal and petroleum formed from the decomposition of ancient animal and plant remains millions of years ago, which provide energy by combustion. So coal and petroleum were formed by the degradation of the biomass millions of years ago. Okay. So the generation of coal and petroleum takes a lot of time. So what are the risks by coal and petroleum? You all know that since coal and petroleum have been formed by biomass, they contain hydrogen, nitrogen and sulfur in addition to carbon. So when these gases are burned, the products are carbon dioxide, water, oxides of nitrogen and oxides of sulfur. 
when combustion takes place in insufficient oxygen then carbon monoxide is formed instead of carbon dioxide of these products the oxides are sulfur and nitrogen and carbon monoxide is are very poisonous at high concentrations and carbon dioxide initially is a greenhouse gas hence these products have to be used very judiciously so coming to the epilogue of this particular lecture or this particular chapter okay epilogue is just a moral to be learned so what we expect you to learn is sustainable management of resources is a difficult task whilst dealing with this issue we should have an open mind with regard to the interests we need to accept that people will act with their own best interest as a priority so even below are two more points read accordingly now let's move to the summary of this particular chapter so we expect the reader to read it so you can pause your video accordingly and go through this So this part of the lecture will help you understand the complete lecture at once. And we usually emphasize on the most important points in this summary. Fine. So here is the end of the lecture. Thank you for watching.